In the second part, we already, we start with going into the future. We have to talk about the digital trends because the digital paradigm, we haven't seen nothing yet. Like really, it's, 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 I mean, it's a quarter of a century dominating the world's evolution already, but I mean, it's just getting started. You are certainly not late learning, learning about this. And we have to have to talk about artificial intelligence, the metaverse, the blockchain, and some things that I picked there, and there could be many others that we could pick just to give you an idea that it's still evolving. And we will start like this exploration of the, the basic, the basis here and how it's evolving with persuasive technology and social media. Why? Because it is a good application of artificial intelligence in recommender algorithms, for example, of communication networks and of massive storage of the digital footprint. And to see also quarter of a century into the digital revolution, what could go wrong? A technology is never inherently good or bad. Remember that it's not technologically deterministic. Technology, it is what it is, it's a tool. And it can be used for the good if we align it with what we really are after. But if you don't really pay attention, it could also go astray and go against what might be healthy for us and for a healthy human or social evolution. And that actually what has, has happened. Traditionally, when we think about the progress of technology or advanced technology, we were always waiting for the point where the machines become better than the best of us. There's a technical term for that, technologically sing te technological singularity. We will talk much more about that. And supposedly, when the machines are better than we, then what happens? Either the Terminator comes or the Matrix or one of them, or we all like... Yes, so that is science fiction. We, we don't, and we have to talk about that a lot, actually, and we will. But what we completely lost sight of is that in order to dominate us, the machines don't have to be better than the best of us. All they have to do is be better than the worst of us. And, you know, we all have good and bad days. And what these machines are is basically they are extensions of the mind. And if we are not in our higher self, then you know this this you know the, the worst of us comes out the the fear the anger the anxiety we get influenced by misinformation the addiction and not being like who is controlled who is in control of of your mind and your mind stuff and so these technologies are extensions and there's no bad intention in the attention economy. And I, like in Silicon Valley, I never met anybody who is like, oh, evil, trying to fill the world with misinformation and anxiety. No, really. It's just the business model that is pursued here. And we have to understand the business model and then see like, oh, maybe, you know, how can we socially construct that, you know, to mitigate the downsides, which are inevitable in every technology and foster uh, the upsides. And the business model here is not even the attention economy, it's one step further, it's a persuasion economy. We pers the, the, these technologies, these recommender algorithms, recommender systems are done to persuade you of something that you did not have in mind before. So it induces behavioral change, often against your will. You didn't have the will to do or buy or click this or like this or, or, or see this. You know, it, it persuaded you of that. That's just what this business model is. So these are extensions of the mind that induce behavioral change often against your own will. Or what is your volition to begin with, right? What is your will or free will? And, and let's, let's, so let's talk about what this business model is. Let's look at it maybe at the biggest, well, certainly the pioneering of the biggest social networks, Facebook, connecting three out of eight people on planet Earth every month. That's insane. Never in human history did we have something like that. Like three out of eight people? Three billion out of, of eight billion people on planet Earth every month connect in this. We never had this in history. So this is really impressive. And uh, how does Facebook do that and offer that actually for free? Well, it sells ads. More. It doesn't even sell ad. It sells predictable behavioral change. And how does it do that? Well, because it knows you very well. Why? Because you leave your digital footprint behind. It knows you better then your parents, your mother, your significant other, better than you yourself. And with this information, you have this information, you have a lot of knowledge, you can get knowledge from it, and you, you have a lot of power. So let's see, let's purchase an ad 
on Facebook. That's You can do that yourself. That's just what the business model is. And it's important that we understand what's happening there in order to see what could go, what could go wrong. So I have an ad here I want to buy. And I want to buy it. I mean, here we are in Davis. Let's say 25 miles. We include Sacramento, Napa Valley. That's where we are. Beautiful area. San Francisco, not all the way there. So basically around here, you know, Northern California. And so I, I purchased there. I want only women between 18 and 21 years of age. So young women and how many do I get here? The Facebook tells me oh, about 100,000. I have 100,000 women. Well, that's way too much. No, no, 100,000. No, I want to get a little bit more specific. So Facebook offers me different options because it knows a lot about its users. So I take them. I want these women to have some college or high school or still in high school. I want them being away from the family, recently moved away from hometown and an upcoming birthday. So like, you know, a little bit unsettled and a little bit sentimental. In a separation, I want them divorced, separated, complicated or widowed. And young parents with a baby younger than a year old and, and working in cleaning. Yeah, I mean, like really like scraping by. I mean, young mother, like working in cleaning services, great. Addicted to beauty and cosmetic products and kinder chocolate. Who has like chocolate and liquor? Of course, let's make it cream liquor. I want them like chocolate, sweet and alcohol. Like great. Discount cards really after coupons and discounts. I mean, yes, young mother with thing working in cleaning. Surely not like not living the riches, right? Tattoo with tattoo and body arts, uh, handbags, and spends her time on soap operas. That's what I want, actually, as my audience. How many do I get? Well, about 12,000, between 11 and 13,000. So 12,000 I, I have here in my audience. And now I want to change them. Like I really want to change, get them to do something that they didn't want before I want to brainwash them basically so then the social media service gives gives me different options what do I want to induce get more messages get more engagements get more leads more visitors get more calls or oh let Facebook let Facebook select the most relevant goals great automatic let AI take over I don't even care let AI take to like just change them change them great so but I, that must be expensive right well how much does that cost well for about 150. A day, it costs for seven days, 150 of these women for seven days, it's about a thousand women cost $10. So that's about a cent per brainwashed woman. That's one cent. So now you yourself can think about how many things could go wrong here. You yourself can purchase that. If you have $10, you could also buy it just for $5, right? And, and specify what, how do you want to change who? So we will go through our framework then. That's why we introduced that as well, to help us to think digitally along these challenges. So how can we socially construct both the software and the human, the user and the application? And we can see maybe there are some things in the software that we want to like really turn turn down. Like maybe you, you, the software should not allow to be to do that on seven year olds. Like just a question, you know, or, or uh, on the human as well. Maybe we as humans like these are mind extensions. Like, are you really in charge? when you get enticed and spend your nights against your will on because actually you wanted to sleep, right? Well, so what, uh, what driver's license that do the humans need to do in order to stay in charge of their minds and maybe also some regulation here. And, and so that's how we will walk through the cube in, in one application. And we think how we can socially construct to do these social networks, which is so many benefits to connect humankind really and, and to really also spread information and knowledge because social networks are the fabric social systems are made out of so how can we socially construct them to align them with our values so that's what we will look at as a first application of the trends of the digital future then in the second part of this same discussions we will go to three specific applications that i just picked and not because they are the ultimate thing there's certainly others i could have picked and and that are coming along and they're brewing in the cauldron of innovation. But these are just three representations of the three basic functions of what you can do with information. You can transmit information through space, through time, or you can transform it. And AI is the leading there, then the metaverse and, and the blockchain, I just picked them 
to show, look, this is it's just getting started. A lot of things are coming down the pipeline. So let's talk about AI, which is very important. The transformation of information, the generating, the automation of job knowledge creation is very different than how we traditionally think about knowledge. We think about traditionally knowledge in our education systems are set up that you have data, you have some kind of observation of reality, and I give you a recipe of what to do with that. So observe reality and I tell you what to do. So here I have two times one is two times two is four times three is 12. Great, great, great. So yeah, yay, pass the exam, right? That's how we create knowledge. Now you created this knowledge, like yeah, do you, have, do you observed, you put that together and you, you computed a result. AI turns that on its head, like it turns it completely around. It says, give me an observation of reality and just tell me where you wanna go. And then I compute the best way of getting there. So I compute what is the best way of putting this data together to get there because there are many ways that lead to Rome. So here's like two plus one is three, squared is nine, plus three is also 12. So what's the better way? Is this one better? Well, it depends. Do you, you have to tell me where you want to go and then do you want to get to Rome quickly or safely or energy efficiently? And then it, the algorithm computes the best algorithm, that's why they call it the master algorithm. So it is the automation of knowledge creation and us homo sapiens, or the homo sapiens sapiens, it hits us pretty much in our, in our pride, right? So that's important. And to see what well, it is artificial intelligence and the artificial intelligence paradigm is basically a machine learning paradigm. So this is machine learning. Machine learning is a subgroup of artificial intelligence and neural nets are very important in machine learning. Then they have deep learning, which is very important in neural nets. And then we have the transformers, which is the generative AI that really gave the last. So we have to talk about this entire zoo of what artificial intelligence is all about. And that's, that's very important. Now, in terms of communication, we traditionally have a, a one-dimensional communication through a telegraph or a telephone, and then two-dimensional, like on the video, like we are here or on TV, for example. And now we go into three-dimensional communication, and that's what they often refer to as the metaverse. Look, this information process, actually for a million of years, is very much trained on three-dimensional perception. So why don't we take advantage of that? And that's the idea, and it's making fast progress here. 30 million people going together in this concert. Only a quarter of the countries on planet Earth have 30 million inhabitants or more. 75% <laughs> don't even like have as many people as meet here together in one cyberspace. Now, that is all fun and games here in the metaverse, but it can also be used for like real economic or, or governmental purposes. So here we have digital twins. That's a technical term. So in industry, they just create a digital twin of their product. So they create the knowledge basically on a simulation. In governments, we do that. We basically create simulations of entire societies. We play these big games. It's kind of like playing a reality game. And we simulate society, everybody in it and every object in it. And then we test out policies. So we create digital twins of our reality. And the metaverse is extremely important there of, of fine tuning that. So that is very complementary to machine learning, which often goes on empirical data. And here we have theoretical exploration of the possible. And finally, the blockchain. I'm a big fan of the blockchain. It's a really ingenious way of storing information. Not massive information, but it's really good. And it, it's so good as, a, as an information storage, has such properties that it has the potential to become the property rights system of the digital age. And property rights are, are very important because they give us incentives to do something. Traditionally, in the agricultural age, we were all having property of land. The Wild West, right? We had to explore it. We had to get to the gold mine and we had to own it and we had to own that land. And we have had probably like the indigenous, they said like, how can you own land? We belong to the earth, not the other way around. But no, the Stone Age, the mines and the things and the agricultural land was very important to us. Countries fought wars over centuries, like every square yard in the mountain range was fought over because land is very important. That defines what a country is, supposedly. Anyway, so land, yeah. <laughs> Well, so much blood be shed and so many like, this is important, having property. And that, that's the agricultural age still. Now, then we learned how to transform energy. 
And we had to patent that. What is the, the, the pattern of potential? So the Industrial Revolution saw, saw patents of intellectual property rights that gives us property of an idea how you can transform something energetically. So the Edisons and the Henry Fords and so forth, they had these intellectual property rights that showed us how to build basically things that we can transform. But all of that doesn't really work for the information age. So the question is, how could you have property of, of, of symbols? Of, of information, of data, of, of knowledge. How could you have property of that? And we will just ask that. And we will ask like, okay, let's come up with a really good property rights system. How could we store information in such a way that we can actually make sure that what is stored is uniquely identifiable? And we just come up with a really good property rights system. And it turns out once we have such a, a ledger that has all the, it clicks all the check marks, uh, it turns out, spoiler alert, at the end, the blockchain will fall out. That's basically what that is. It's an information ledger that is so good that you can assign property to information. Now, this property could be a monetary value. I could say they are $3 and I write that on the blockchain or three coins or whatever. Then we call it cryptocurrency. But that's all about one application, right? All the Bitcoins and stuff, that's not uh, the, final, the final. You can write any, anything here. You can put whatever on the blockchain. For example, an art piece. Who belongs? Who made this art piece? Then uh, it's all a song, for example. Then it's called a non-fungible token. You can give property to that as well. Or a smart contract. You can write a contract on there. Basically, automate. That is very important for the economy, for governments as well, having these smart contracts. You can even like put the constitution up there or a constitution or whatever it is, a governance structure, then we call it a decentralized autonomous organization. That's basically what a DAO is and, and whatever. You can put whatever up on the blockchain. So we will have to discuss that as well. And that rounds up our exploration of digital trends. It's a little, little longer, but I also wanted to show you that, as I said, if you haven't seen anything yet, the digital revolution just gets going. And these are some, and there are many others that we could include. And it's actually not so important, but it's important that we have a feeling of, yeah, this is just getting started. So I'm very much looking forward to exploring that together with you.